OK, I think we can start with colleagues joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 28 for 28 webinar entitled Climate Change and the Arctic. I'm Ridan Asaqqa from the United Nations Resident Coordinator Office in the UAE, and we have an exciting event today for you. The Arctic is a fragile ecosystem that plays a central role, role in our planetary health and well-being, but it's also disproportionately affected by climate change with irreversible impacts that affect uh, our delicate balance. To start, perhaps I'd like to invite uh, His Excellency Trond Rudi, the Charge Affair in the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Abu Dhabi for some opening remarks. Uh, Trond, you have the floor. Thank you for the introduction and, uh, and thank you for taking the initiative uh, hosting this uh, event today, um, which happened to be on the Norwegian National Day. Um, the event is, of course, COP28 relevant uh, and relevant to the UAE. Uh, not only as COP host, uh, but as an energy producer, energy consumer, a trading hub, a financial hub, etc. Uh, climate changes are visible and pressing in the Arctic region. Uh, 11th of May, Norway uh, took over the chairmanship or the chairship, as we say, of the Arctic Council. Uh, we are looking forward to chairing the Arct Arctic Council for the next two years. Uh, it is vital that the Council maintains its role as the most important multilateral forum um, for issues addressing or uh, for for um, uh, addressing issues relating to the Arctic. The four priority areas for the Norwegian chairship are the oceans, climate and environment, sustainable economic development, and people in the north. In addition, Norway, Norway will focus particularly on Arctic youth and Arctic indigenous people. Uh, the Council is a unique platform for cooperation between Arctic states and Arctic indigenous people. And the, under the climate and environment priority, Norway will also focus on short-lived climate forces, forces such as black carbon and methane, an area where the Arctic states have a key role to play. The Arctic Council has a collective goal to reduce black carbon emissions by 2025. For more than 25 years, the Arctic Council has played a key role in Arctic cooperation. Uh, the Council is a unique platform for cooperation between Arctic states and Arctic indigenous peoples. It is vital that the Arctic states continue to take responsibility for addressing climate changes and its impacts on ecosystems and people in the Arctic. Uh, we look forward during our chairship to strengthen and increase the visibility of the work carried out by the Council. We will do everything we can to ensure that the Arctic Council maintains its role as a forum for addressing these pressing issues, cross-border challenges we are facing in the Arctic, such as the need for access to data on climate change and the need to ensure sustainable management of resources and adequately balances considerations relating to the natural surroundings, animal life, and people living in the Arctic. The eyes of those living in, in the Arctic will also be on, U, on the UAE and Dubai during COP28. COP28 is uh, very important to them. Um, let me stop here and again, thank you for this initiative. Uh, thank you very much and best wishes to you and the Norwegian people on the national occasion of the National Day. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Melinda Webster, the Arctic, sea, uh, the Arctic Sea Ice Working Group Lead at WMO for the lead presentation. Melinda, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if I can share my screen and then we can get started. Okay, I think I have it now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, present 
what knowledge I have of climate change in the Arctic with you and the different perspectives and effects of this climate change in the Arctic. I'm Melinda Webster. I'm a sea ice geophysicist at the University of Washington. And uh, all the work that I'm showing here today is drawn on a massive international collaborative effort. Um, I will be speaking to things outside of my expertise. And if you'd like more details of that, you can look at these resources that I have listed here. Okay, so let's begin. We're gonna be thinking about change in the Arctic, but first let's step back and think about the amount of carbon emissions in the atmosphere and what that is doing to our climate. Uh, of course, I think many of you are familiar with what greenhouse gas can do. It acts like an insulating blanket in the Earth's atmosphere so that, um, here, let me make sure I can get an annotation. There we go. Uh, with carbon gas in the atmosphere, it's trapping the heat emitted from the Earth's surface going to the space. Um, so if we have greater and greater greenhouse gases, we have a more efficient insulating atmosphere that's going to warm our planet. And in some ways, it's a clean, simple relationship. As you add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you have increased global temperature. Um, it's linear, it's a line, you know, this is really a straightforward relationship to understand. But what's not so easy to understand is the impacts and the effects of this warming and carbon emissions on the different aspects of our climate system, particularly in the Arctic. And that's what I wanna talk about today. So let's go to the Arctic um, and let's see how surface temperatures are being impacted by carbon emissions there. So this is a time series animation of the anomalies in surface temperature compared to the 1951 to 1980 average. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of spatial variability in these anomalies from years to years. But what's really notable is what's happening in the Arctic towards the end of uh, the 2000 and 2010s is this dramatic warming. This is an area in the Arctic that's warming faster than anywhere on our planet. And this is really what's a dramatic, just profound changes across the board from an ecosystem perspective, from a livelihood perspective, and from a climate perspective. And to get an idea of what this looks like, uh, let's go to the Arctic ourselves. Let's look at this from a bird's eye perspective. Now to orient yourself, this is the North Pole. This is Greenland, Canada, Alaska, Russia, Finland, and Sweden. And what you're seeing is the seasonal cycle of Arctic sea ice in the central Arctic Ocean, as well as the snow cover on land. And you can see this cycling with winter growth you know, the snow accumulates on land, the sea ice expands over the Arctic Ocean, and then it cycles in with summer melt. And it's this cycling, this pulsing that is so critical for regulating our climate. And as you very well know, uh, the efficiency of the system is starting to break down. If you think of this cycling as the air conditioning unit of the Earth system, uh, it's not as efficient as it once be, as it once was, sorry. Um, and this is really uh, illustrated by the profound changes happening in the Arctic sea ice. Uh, what I want to show you here, so in this upper right panel here, these are two snapshots. This is from 1985, and the colors indicate the age of the sea ice. So the red, the warmer colors are ice that is quite old. It's ice that survived many uh, summer melt seasons. And when Arctic sea ice survives multiple summer melt seasons, it grows thicker over time. And if it's thicker, it's more resilient. It's harder to break by the wind and the ocean currents. And it's also uh, more resilient to summer melt. It requires more radiation, more energy to melt that ice. So in the mid 1980s, we had a pretty healthy sea ice cover um, that was very thick, very old. But if you fast forward to 2020, there's just a sliver of that old ice left in the Arctic. What once covered about 60% of the Arctic uh, ice cover, which was old ice, is now something like 30%. So 
This means that we have more of a seasonal ice cover, ice that is thinner, weaker, and is easier to melt. So it melts back every summer and we're getting a less extensive sea ice cover. And you can see this in uh, the left-hand plot. This is the Arctic sea ice extent by the month. And there's some interesting things with this, uh, this figure. So first off, the earlier part of the satellite record, so this was 1981 to 2010. This average, this is showing the aerial coverage of the ice. This is a pretty healthy ice cover, but in the past decade, the most recent decade, it is a dramatic loss in Arctic sea ice. So what impact does this Arctic sea ice change have? Um, firstly, it affects the ocean to quite a degree. Um, when Arctic sea ice forms in the autumn time, so when the ocean starts cooling and these little ice crystals start to form, a lot of the salt in the seawater is left behind as those ice crystals form and it makes the seawater salty, denser, and then it sinks. So you can see these little uh, dense uh, salt being rejected into the seawater below as ice on top forms. Now imagine this on a vast scale. This is happening across the Arctic Ocean in the autumn. It's happening in the Antarctic Ocean, or in the Southern Ocean in the Austral Autumn. On such a vast spatial scale, this is overturning ocean circulation. This is what drives thermohaline circulation. So when we have changes in Arctic sea ice formation, whether it's the timing of its formation or the amount of sea ice being formed, it's going to have a propagating effect on how the global ocean circulation works. And this is important because this is what helps distribute heat around our planet. Now, Arctic sea ice also plays an essential role in keeping the polar atmosphere cool, especially during the winter time. So sea ice itself, it's really good at being a cap or blanket on top of the ocean, trapping the heat inside the ocean itself. And of course, the ice is also very dynamic. It moves with the winds and the ocean currents, so cracks form and a lot of heat can get spewed up through to the atmosphere. Um, but with the Arctic sea ice cover, which was once very old and very thick, this was a still a very insulating blanket on top of our Arctic Ocean. But now, since Arctic sea ice is much thinner and less extensive, it's not as efficient at keeping the polar atmosphere cool. There's a lot more heat going into the atmosphere each autumn, winter, and spring. Now, one of the last key things about the Arctic sea ice cover and the implications of its loss is what happens to the albedo of the surface. So I think many of you have heard of this, uh, the ice albedo feedback, this is what happens when you lose a highly reflective surface and it gets replaced with a darker surface. So for ice and snow on top of the ice, it reflects about 70 to 90% of the solar radiation back into space. And one thing I like to ask uh, kids when I'm teaching is, what do you think the reflectivity is of the ocean, the stuff that's replacing this sea ice? And oftentimes there isn't a right answer because it's an order of magnitude less. It's only 7% of the sunlight that hits the ocean is reflected back into space. So that's quite a large difference in terms of reflectivity of, of the surface and the effects of Arctic sea ice loss. Now this is kind of a, a overview of the scientific and the physical understanding of what sea ice loss is doing, but what about the effects of Arctic sea ice loss on the ecosystem and on people? And that's what I want to talk about next. Now, uh, coming back to this ice albedo effect in sunlight and solar radiation, uh, because Arctic sea ice is thinning and the snow cover on top of Arctic sea ice is also thinning in many regions, it's allowing more sunlight to reach the underlying ocean and because melt onset of the surface is happening earlier, that's removing the snow earlier, that means you have more sunlight earlier in the season. Now, you might think that this could be good for some things like phytoplankton, which is like an ocean-based plant. But in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, there are ice algae. These are a type of phytoplankton that are specially adapted to low light levels. 
And as more and more light comes through the ice into the underlying ocean earlier in the season, it's actually detrimental to this ice algae. They get sunburned and then they die. And this is not such a good thing because there are many species that rely on this ice algae, especially as phytoplankton and zooplankton rely on this ice algae. And if these die off earlier and earlier in the season, it creates this timing offset between these other species that like to prey or to feed on these ice algae. Um, but this is one issue. So this is uh, showing an example of one species that is not doing well with this change, but there are some species that are doing better with Arctic sea ice loss namely open ocean or ocean going phytoplankton are doing better in the Arctic. And in fact, there have been an increasing number of open ocean phytoplankton blooms in the Arctic in recent decades. Another thing that's happening from the ocean perspective in the Arctic is the amount of ocean acidification that's occurring. So oceans are very effective at um, uptaking carbon or sequestering carbon. But as they uptake carbon, that reduces the pH level of the ocean. So this means that it becomes more acidic or more corrosive. This is problematic for many phytoplankton species because they form um, these calcium carbonate shells. That's the structure of uh, many of these phytoplankton. But with a more acidic ocean, these shells start breaking down. They can't fully form their uh, exterior structure, which is problematic. This means that they have lower success rates um, and this has a cascading effect on the marine food web. So comparing this, uh, this type of phenomenon to other parts of the Arctic or other parts of the globe, the Arctic Ocean is acidifying faster than the global ocean on average, but there is high spatial variability in that acidification. Now, if we're seeing and documenting these changes to the marine ecosystems, uh, specifically the base of the food web or base of the food chain, you can probably guess that there are these cascading effects on higher trophic orders or things that feed on these phytoplankton. So especially bird species and marine mammals, they're taking big hits with Arctic sea ice loss by uh, being directly affected by habitat loss for instance, for polar bears and walrus, um, or also mortality events. So not having enough food to eat or not having the right food to eat. And a good example of this impact is looking at the die-offs that have been observed in the Bering Sea area with um, seabirds. So this has been a, an initiative that's been carried out for uh, at least six years now, and there have been more and more seabird die-offs happening. Uh, which is concerning, uh, it raises the issue of there being potential ecosystem shifts in species distribution. So I've been discussing the effects on the ecosystem, but this is also affecting people as well. There's more maritime traffic in the Arctic than ever before. Um, and this has pros and cons, but I do wanna talk about the large risks associated with these changes. Uh, for one, there is the risk of traveling through uncharted waters. Uh, quite literally, there are places that are not well documented, which runs a risk of um, collisions or issues with uh, um, ship traffic and collisions in that sense. Also, the ice, um, even though it's projected to be an ice-free Arctic in, uh, by mid-century, that doesn't mean it's going to be completely free of ice. Uh, there will be ice in winter, there will be icebergs present, and this also poses a, a significant risk to maritime traffic. Being the Arctic, it's an extreme environment, it's a remote environment, so uh, this poses a lot of issues for people getting caught out in the Arctic or getting caught out in ships in bad weather. There are limited assets for search and rescue operations in the Arctic because of its remote location. And then lastly, um, well, there are many more things to expand on, but one point I do want to emphasize is the stresses that this has on Arctic peoples and the ecosystem. For instance, if there's more and more traffic, especially in Bering Strait and in Bering Sea, 
what impact does that have on coastal communities, indigenous communities that do subsistence hunting activities such as spring whaling? What are the connections there and what are the anthropogenic stresses that can occur with increased traffic in the Arctic? Now with warming temperatures and warming oceans, there have been uh, an increased loss in the Greenland ice sheet uh, with increasing green, with the uh, loss in the Greenland ice sheet, of course, this water needs to go somewhere and it goes into the ocean. So we are seeing an increase in sea level rise. Uh, between August, 2021 and September, 2022, um, there's, it was documented to have an increase of about four millimeters of sea level rise due to the Greenland ice melt within that year period. Now, with increasing sea level rise, uh, this has many effects across the globe. And the ones I'm focusing on here are specific to the Arctic. And this has to do with coastal erosion and also storm surges. So uh, a case example from Typhoon Murbach, which happened uh, last year, it hit the Alaska coastline and it created just massive damage to these communities and disrupted not only their infrastructure, uh, but also uh, completely disrupted their harvest and um, subsistence hunting activities in preparation for the following winter. So these extreme events tied with sea level rise and a more um, ice-free ocean, this all is a pretty bad combination for coastal communities in terms of coastal erosion and flooding and decimation. Now with increasing temperatures, uh, there's also been an increase in precipitation in the Arctic. Uh, there is regional variability, but as a whole, there is a documented increase. And it's also affecting the patterns in precipitation. So what comes in the form of snow versus what comes in the form of rain. And this has implications for the amount of snowmelt and the amount of uh, snow feeding into glaciers and ice sheets, but also what happens on the surface. So uh, this example, and I think this is in Finland, is where there's these clear ice layers within the snowpack, which impede the reindeer and also caribou and moose from reaching the vegetation underneath the snowpack. And if Snow on rain, snow, uh, sorry, if rain on snow is a more frequent occurrence during the winter time, this is going to have a negative impact on uh, not just reindeer, moose, and caribou, but the people who rely on those species for subsistence hunting. Now, with warming temperatures, we're also seeing a thawing in the permafrost. Um, and there are two uh, aspects to this issue that I think are important to highlight. One is thawing permafrost is a major source of carbon and methane. You know, 14 to 175 billion tons of carbon dioxide is projected to be released per one degree of warming. That's significant. Um, but the other side of this is what impact this thawing permafrost has from a local perspective on communities in the Arctic. Uh, there's this nice study by Ramage et al. And they showed that there was 4.94 million people living in permafrost areas in 2017. And based on model projections of permafrost uh, loss due to thawing, there would be a 61% decrease in the populations by 2050. And the communities that are hardest hit by this, or the countries that are hardest hit by this rather, are Finland, and uh, Sweden and Norway. So these black circles are permafrost settlements in uh, 2017. But the green is what's projected to be remaining by 2050. So you can see there's a massive change, not just in these Scandinavian countries, but in Russia and Alaska as well. With warmer temperatures, we also have a longer wildfire season. Wildfires are happening more frequently, they're lasting longer, and they're more intense. Of course, this is an obvious uh, hazard for structures like oil pipelines and uh, communities themselves. But this is also a source of enhanced greenhouse gas emissions. It degrades the air quality locally. And it's also an important source for black carbon deposition. So, 
I've kind of given a quick run through of all these things that are happening and I felt like I've skinned the surface. Um, but where can we go from here? And what's our outlook? Well, warming is projected to continue. With warming, there will be more climate-driven disturbances. So this, these are disturbances that not only affect um, the ecosystem and nature itself, but cultural livelihoods and people's livelihoods. This includes extreme weather, flooding, wildlife mortality events, and so on. Many of the things that I've covered here today. Um, so where can we go from here? And I think what can be a helpful perspective is coming back to this figure of our simple clean relationship between carbon dioxide and warming. Uh, with increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we see warming. So why don't we uh, reverse engineer this scenario? Why don't we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to mitigate further warming? That seems like the simple solution here, but in reality, it's more complex than that. Um, but yeah, I would like to open it up to discussion now. And also, thank you all for listening. I appreciate uh, what feedback you have from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda, for a very insightful and engaging presentation. Um, it, it's, it comes across as quite grim, but I hope maybe with the, with the also inputs from our fellow commentaries, we'll be able to have a more informed discussion touching on multiple aspects. So I invite colleagues, if you have any questions, to put them in the chat in the meantime, but I would like to also request that our colleague David from Ian UNCTAD engages with us in a commentary reflecting on this topic. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Raidan. Thank you for invite. Uh, my name is David Divas. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer, trade lawyer. Nobody's perfect, so I will bring a different approach to the information data brought. The first point is that uh, obviously we don't want the Arctic to melt or to change. No, that's the first point. Uh, but changes are happening. And that's bringing some opportunities and challenges in economic terms that some nations are seizing and some nations are looking with interest and may change how we do things in the northern hemisphere. I will make points on the following items. The level of the high sea, the size of the high sea area in that uh, in the Arctic. I will speak about fisheries. I will speak a little bit about connectivity, uh, tourism, bioprospecting and marine protected areas. And if we have time, blue carbon. There are many areas. So on the high seas area first, we need to be aware uh, that we have the Arctic Council, but uh, about 2.9 million square kilometers of the Arctic are high seas, meaning non subject to sovereign rights by uh, states surrounding the Arctic. And this uh, area is still quite unregulated. There are some aspects that have been regulated or where coordination, monitoring and cooperation exist, but it is an area that will need a significant amount of engagement to define rules for use, sustainable use, hopefully. On fisheries, uh, we have a, a Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. This was very important outcome because somehow established a kind of, it's not exactly a moratorium, but it's a, an agreement to prevent the intensification of fishing for commercial purposes in the Arctic for the next 16 years. It enter, entered into force in 2021. That's very important. So the idea was to take a precautionary principle, let's build the science first, and second, see if there will be any opportunities for fishing. Obviously, if the Arctic melts, especially on seasonal uh, periods, they could be significant migrations of fish and plankton species and blooming of plankton th that attracts fish and other small species like krill into the Arctic. Now, uh, many reports, especially by the FAO and several agencies have said that due to the climate change in the Arctic, but also in the Antarctic. Many fish species that are suffering from heat wave, especially in the tropical areas such as El Nino, a phenomenon that happens specifically in the Ecuador area, uh, fish is moving northern and southern, and it's moving deeper. So you will have certain species that are, that are used and need cold water to be moving upwards. Obviously, if fish move, that will imply that many fishers will also like to follow the fish and also the reproduction patterns of this fish. So this is a phenomenon that is already happening. We need to monitor. 
we need to take advantage of these 16 years because the area is not regulating for commercial fishing activities. And if that will ever happen, we'll have to be very sure that we take again precaution and anything that is done there is done on sustainable use basis. Uh, again, we don't have a Arctic fish management system in place as of today. An important caveat to complement this this uh, uh, this uh, COPOA agreement, CAOFA agreement, sorry, is that uh, the recent WTO agreement on fishery subsidies prohibits subsidies to fishing in unregulated areas of the high seas. Again, we have a big chunk of the unregulated area of the high seas, almost 3 million square kilometers, as I mentioned, to give you an idea of the size, the size of Argentina. And uh, again, no government that will subscribe to this WTO agreement should be putting public money to do any type of fishing in that area as it is explicitly prohibited. So we have complementary rules coming in trade to uh, also support environmental and sustainability objectives. On connectivity, the previous speaker was great when she showed the uh, I, I have similar data, showed the increased number of chips operating in the Arctic and increased connectivity in the Arctic. And this is mainly happening in the route uh, Northern Europe towards Northern Asia. And this mainly happens during summer times. It's not any chips. Those are a special type of chips. There are many challenges about what this implies in many terms. Many of the ones listed the PowerPoint, but also in terms of its basic species, uh, in terms of security, in terms of impact o o on ecosystems. But at the same time, there is a, a, a potential positive uh, emission benefit, which is that it has been estimated that if that route becomes more open, especially in summer, uh, cargo from Northern Europe to Asia and vice versa could reduce emissions from 30 to 50 percent from maritime transport. Because if you take the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal route, it could be many more uh, sailing days, shipping days than through the route in the Northern Arctic. So this is very important to consider because again, there are risks, but there are also some potential benefits in terms of emission and efficiency. Now, the type of cargo that you are getting into that region is mainly raw materials, uh, natural liquid gas and this type of thing. So it's not a, 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 a necessarily the cargo is not a sustainable use. It's mainly leads to fossil fuel. So another element to consider. But this is this is already happening and it's uh, obviously subject to the freedoms of the sea under UN clause, but also to IMO rules, including MARPOL, especially on emissions. Let's continue. Sorry if I have to go quickly, but there are many sectors. The other sector that is opening uh, quite quickly is Arctic tourism, especially cruise tourism. There is also Arctic tourism in the in the northern part of Norway, Sweden, Laponia, uh, also linked to indigenous communities uh, working together or not happy about it. Uh, in the case of cruise tourism, there are, there are many companies offering right now cruise tourism to the Arctic of different forms. Some are exploratory, interesting, related to science. Some are just uh, leisure tourism to look at the, at, the, at the ice caps and the species like polar bears and others in the north. But it's happening and will have big impacts. Uh, it could have also in land terms big impacts, especially in Greenland, nor uh, Norway, northern Sweden, Russia, Siberia, etc., even with the impacts of climate change. Now, there are two aspects that I think there are also potentials, uh, but this is linked to a new treaty, a new, uh, it's not yet a treaty, it's a, a, an agreement, a draft agreement adopted recently under the UN, the uh, Treaty on Biodivers Marine Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. The important of this treaty is regulate three things that will be important for any sustainable use of marine resources or activities in the Arctic. The first one, it regulates marine bioprospecting, uh, potential commercial uses of marine species from microorganisms to more complex species, uh, and that's regulated under the treaty, not only in the access to the species in itself, but also to digital, digital sequencing, including benefit sharing and also benefit sharing for local indigenous communities. 
So that's an aspect that needs to be considered and that's an area for a lot of potential. The other areas are not about potential, but about ensuring there is sustainable management. One is the potential to create marine protected areas. This is an area that the Arctic Council need to think. Uh, we need to increase by 30% all protected areas in the planet according to the post-2030 biodiversity framework. So I think the Arctic offer opportunities to protect even ex ante before any new acti economic activity comes to ensure that the regulations for marine protected area are agreed among uh, neighboring countries to the Arctic. Second, we have impact assessment schemes. In the also in the biodiversity treaty, this is very important because all members willing to do activities in the high seas will have to do this impact assessment. And this impact assessment, if you read the, the draft agreement with CALM, it applies to any activity. When you say any, there is no definition of activity. So basically, from seabed mining, oil and gas to transport to fisheries to anything. So if not regulated, we will have to look very clearly at this treaty as a source of guidance. Finally, I will try to go quickly. There is also some opportunities, but very insipid in terms of blue carbon. Again, you have some kelp forests in some certain areas of the Arctic, especially closer to the coast, more than the high seas of each country. Uh, uh, but uh, again, this is incipient. Everybody is very excited about blue carbon, but so far I only know one case of carbon uh, um, credits for one help forests in Japan is very insipid, so it will probably go first in tropical areas, in mangroves and other areas, in kelp forests in tropical areas where they are bigger than in the Arctic, but it could be a potential economic opportunity in the longer term when we have a better mapping of kelp forests and the amount of carbon that could be captured, and if this is an additional contribution to climate change or is just a carbon sink according to existing uh, uh, natural endowments. With this, I just wanted to give you a general overview of the economic potential. There might be questions. I'm just here to answer and thank you very much for the opportunity. I have put some, some additional uh, literature in the chat in case you want to go deeper in the ocean. We go deeper. We don't go further. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for your rich engagement. Uh, we would need a standalone session to, <laughs> to delve over to the details, but I do invite colleagues to look into the chat and uh, have a look at these references. Uh, perhaps I can move to our next uh, commentary by Gunbert, Gun, Gunbert uh, Ritter from the UNFCCC's Indigenous Peoples uh, platform. Gunbert, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, in the UN system, uh, the indigenous social cultural region Arctic consists of Sami and Inuit, and I will base my examples on, on this region and the Arctic region. And both uh, Inuit and Sami are cross-boundary peoples, and we are the people that like it cold, and uh, we have deep experience in coping with snow and ice. I'm myself a Sami person from the coastal Sami community Unyar Gnesebi by the Varjetvun, uh, far northeast in Norway, close to both the Finnish and Russian border. Uh, the Sami people live across these borders and in Sweden as well. For us, for us, this region in, in for us this region is Sapmi. Uh, during the present three-year term. I am the Arctic representative to in the local community and indigenous peoples platform. And my organization, Sami Council, is one of the permanent participants in the Arctic Council. Uh, I'm also our head of delegation to Arctic Council. And as we just heard, the Arctic ecosystems are experiencing rapid transformational changes with impacts on productivity, seasonality, distribution, and interactions of species, and thus resulting in major impacts on socio-ecological systems. The Inuit live in Greenland, Canada, US, and Russian Federation. Climate change affects Inuit food security, culture, language, health, and thus the human rights of Inuit. It is all connected. Examples of environmental changes include dangerous sea ice conditions for traveling and hunting, an influx of new species across both lands and in waters, an increase in vessel traffic, impacting marine habitats, and numerous other transformations, as we already heard in the introduction. Inuit communities are prepared to respond. Uh, the ingenuity 
genuity and knowledge held by Inuit provide solutions, adaptation strategies, and innovative management approaches grounded in Inuit knowledge. In Sapmi, climate warming is already altering the ecological and cultural landscape in many ways. Reindeer uh, is a uh, um, our major cultural and economic significance for Sami culture as part of social ecological systems incorporating social, cultural, ecological and economic values. Reindeer husbandry is dependent on functioning and I use reindeer husbandry as an example. There are other livelihoods as well. Uh, Reindeer husbandry is dependent on functioning ecosystems and the annual cycle of reindeer ecology that determines the seasonal herding activities. Climate change impacts on reindeer and reindeer herding stem from both slow onset changes and extreme weather events. Changes in vegetation and plant community composition pose risks to the quality and availability of pasture, which reduces reindeer health and survival. Events related to winter precipitation with extreme snowfall and increased occurrences of rain on snow and thawing freezing due to shifting temperatures have already resulted in losses in herds in Sapmi due to thick snow cover and ice barriers over lichens and mosses starving reindeer, which you already saw in the picture. Uh, <clears throat> all these changes, which is important for me to emphasize, that negatively impact the reindeer and reindeer husbandry, ris risk resulting in severe, severe impacts on the whole Sami culture where the reindeer is the backbone. In understanding in, in the challenges uh, we face, uh, I need uh, in understanding the challenges the Sami people overall are, are uh, facing, I need to mention also large industrial projects, many of which are put in place for climate mitigation, are so, sought to be established on reindeer herding lands, which in addition to climate change is shrinking grazing areas and causing more disturbances. And it directly causes loss of lands and stress for the reindeer and herders, which is challenging our traditional way of adapting to what would be environmental climate, uh, climate changes. And this, also climate change, as I said, and the industrial kind of green uh, energy production have impacts on our cultures. In addressing climate change and live up to the Paris Agreement, I think the big question is how to transform into low emission society, which means to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, get off fossil fuels and transit to alter alternative energy sources without placing the burden of this shift on the indigenous peoples and our land and territories. So that is doing the transition without compromising cultures that has kept the nature and its ecosystems intact. Healthy nature and healthy people increase the resilience to climate change. So if our lands are challenged, our cultures and uh, health of our people are challenged as well. I mentioned the, the ELSIP, the Local Community and Indigenous Peoples Platform. This is body and gather, uh, which is gathering these observations that I briefly shared about and experience of indigenous peoples globally. Uh, LSIP mandate is to strengthen the knowledge, technologies and practices and efforts of local communities and indigenous peoples related to addressing and responding to climate change, to facilitate the exchange of experience and the sharing of best practices and lessons learned on mitigation and adaptation in a holistic and integrated manner and to enhance engagement of local communities and indigenous peoples in the climate convention process. So as such, the ELSIP stands ready to contribute to the, to the, the other constituted bodies and the uh, negotiations, or to the negotiations to the, to the uh, presidencies and, and to the processes in the climate convention. In conclusion, 
uh, we have it's a very short time to to go through this, but while both Inuit and Sami are taking action to monitor, mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change, we engage in the climate convention to work to get governments to do more. Inuit, Sami and other Arctic indigenous and other indigenous peoples, we did not create the climate crisis. At COP28, if I may, we must see further commitments for dramatic systematic systemic changes to meet the goals of the Paris Accord while respecting the rights of indigenous peoples. And we must end the falsely dichotomized way of viewing the world as developing or developed. This is necessary to allow for equitable access to the loss and damage fund that is being established. Inuit and Sami have been observing environmental and ecological changes across Inuit, Nunat and Sami for decades. We have been calling for action at every COP since 1995. And as the global stock take proceeds, meaningful and equal partnership with Inuit, Sami and indigenous peoples across the globe must be prioritized in order to collect actively address the climate crisis. Ethical and equitable engagement with indigenous peoples on ways forward for the Arctic is critical. Thank you for the attention and the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Gunbret, for sharing your reflections uh, and your emphasis on biodiversity as well and the impact that has on socioeconomic well-being of the indigenous peoples. Last but not least, I'd like to invite our colleague Doug Fenner Sven Björson from the Arctic Circles. Uh, Doug Fenner, you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, can you see me? Or is this is the technology working? Yes, we can see and hear you. Uh, thank you very much for this very comprehensive presentation about uh, climate change in the Arctic. Uh, if I may, I will take uh, follow up, following up on the previous commentary, I will uh, offer uh, reflections on a different aspect of uh, the implications of climate change in the Arctic namely to uh, focus on the global implications and relationships with uh, other parts of the planet. Uh, but before I uh, discuss that, then uh, I can also report that I was attending the attending a seminar at the Icelandic Meteorological Office yesterday. And uh, <clears throat> as it happens, the glaciers of Iceland are the most thoroughly researched glaciers in the world due to the fact that it has been possible to collect data for very extensive periods. And, uh, and uh, there they reported that the melting of the Icelandic glaciers is taking place uh, beyond expectations, so to speak, so to speak. And that reminds us of the general fact that uh, due to the fact due to the practice of science, scientists need to be careful and therefore predictions by scientists about the nature and speed and of melting of ice in the Arctic has been marked by systematic underestimations in recent years. But it's very alarming to then hear from the presentation in the beginning uh, how rapidly the sea ice is uh, melting in recent years as uh, and according to a uh, new finding that I came across recently uh, the melting has been really taking off with uh, remarkable speed in the last uh, three years or so since 2019 and the <clears throat> aspect of this that I would like to bring to the table and to highlight are the so-called uh, teleconnections that is to say the way in which melting of ice in the Arctic affects uh, distant parts of the planet and in particular in Asia. And uh, <clears throat> according to uh, an, an, a new finding uh, that I came across, uh, uh, there perhaps um, where there it was identified or presented uh, so that decline of sea ice in the Barents and Kara Sea, where the melting of the sea ice is most advanced, as I understand it, uh, accounts for possibly one third of winter warming over the Tibetan plateau. 
and uh, <clears throat> and so there's this connection between melting ice in the Arctic and the warming of the sea, which affects the global weather system, and uh, and affects and creates uh, or is a determining causal factor, let's say, according to recent scientific evidence. Uh, of changing patterns of the monsoon in South Asia with uh, dramatic consequences for food production and agriculture across the continent. And uh, it also, as noted before, uh, accelerates the melting of ice in Tibet with, uh, with very serious consequences for the water resources of China and uh, across Southeast and South Asia. And it has, is also attributed, uh, uh, also contributes to the uh, increased frequency of disasters and dramatic weather events in, uh, in particular South Asia and also in East Asia. Uh, and, the, and the cases in point uh, in, uh, recently have been, for example, the increasing frequency of cyclones in Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal, and uh, also the dramatic floods in Pakistan. And, uh, and then there are these more drawn out catastrophic and disastrous events, which can be seen in glacial outburst floods, particularly where uh, the eastern part of Nepal is particularly a uh, dangerous uh, area and also is uh, it's a national disaster. It identifies that the national disaster uh, disaster risk number one in the in the uh, Buddhist kingdom of Bhutan, and uh, and so uh, I would like to therefore bring this to the table that the melting of the of ice in the Arctic uh, is perhaps the strongest illustration of the way in which climate change is having a very global um, impact and uh, as such is therefore is also the strongest case and illustration of the need for global collaboration on uh, scientific research uh, as it has been for many for a number of years as we can see with increasing research activity of Asian countries in the Arctic and active participation uh, for example, in the Arctic Circle assemblies and forums and uh, and also as observer states in the Arctic Council. And uh, and there and as such, it also becomes uh, among the strongest arguments for a more decisive uh, co collaboration and uh, deliberations for the COP28 proceedings. Uh, more decisive uh, steps towards uh, developing uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, climate finance arrangements uh, and uh, to accelerate the clean energy transformation of the world's uh, energy systems. And so, uh, as I realize we are coming close to our time limit, uh, therefore, this is my concluding observation uh, the presentation that has that was uh, presented uh, about the dramatic speed of climate change in the Arctic and the multidimensional consequences uh, which do reach Asia and distant parts of the planet is uh, arguably the strongest argument for global action uh, to address uh, the challenge of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dijkvinder, for sharing that observation. Um, and it actually links to the discussion questions that we have and how we can link this and with the global perspective towards COP28. I see in the chat two questions, and perhaps I can add a third. One question touches with the uh, impact of the changing uh, climate in the Arctic and how it affects rainfalls. And Dijkvinder, you just touched on that between the Kara Sea and the Indian Ocean and how that has showcases a truly global impact of how warming temperatures in the Arctic contribute to a more volatile monsoon and, and also the melting of the glaciers in the in the third pole region. So I feel that is one key issue perhaps we can touch on. Uh, there was also a second question in relation to the changes of the magnetic North Pole and if it also affects climate change or is it only limited to uh, 
uh, navigation or navigational matters. And if I can add a third question on that is on the uh, socioeconomic benefits from the changing weather in the Arctic and how that can be redistributed to communities in the Arctic uh, from having more of an equitable stance. And I note also that the changes in biodiversity and how it affects livelihoods and the, up and the different uh, dynamics. There was a mention of permafrost, which can be somewhat scary, especially for a non-expert like myself and what that could unleash having just come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So maybe we can uh, discuss these questions in the same order and we hear also reflections starting with Melinda and then we can go with the same organization before we close. Melinda, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. So uh, this is in relation to the first question in the chat about the spring heat waves and lack of rain. Is that right? <clears throat> yes, and the changing weather okay. dynamics around the world, including the monsoons yeah. and the... Uh, yeah, yeah. The um, I really appreciate the, the discussion about teleconnections. I think that that's such an important topic of research and it's an active area of research. Um, and they, there are connections that are quite strong between the Arctic and mid-latitude weather. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. But for this specific question about the current spring heat waves and lack of rain in Southern Europe, um, whether it's related to the imbalances in the ocean currents in the Arctic or is it something else? Um, I don't have a specific answer to that. It could be related to the changes ongoing in the Arctic or it could be natural climate variability. And I think it's important to disentangle those two. Um, so climate variability, an example of that is El Nino and La Nina. We've had three La Nina winters in a row, and that is having some pretty big uh, effects on local weather around the mid-latitudes. Um, but this is where climate model analyses are really the right tool for getting at a question like this, where they can disentangle natural climate variability from climate change. Uh, so I, I don't have that answer for you, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And if I can just also ask you on the point of the magnetic North Pole, does that affect the changing weather? Uh, so for the climate simulations that we rely on for projecting what's going to happen, uh, yes, that is taken to account the changes in the orbital uh, path of the Earth and the sun inclination, everything like that is incorporated into these projections, whether it's looking at simulations from paleoclimate uh, examples or projecting out to the future. So those are accounted for in these climate models. Thank you, Melinda. Maybe we can invite also David and Gumbret to share some reflections. Uh, I'm, I'm touching on my point, my question on the equitable benefits and engaging local communities. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, ladies first, ladies always first. <laughs> yeah, sorry to, to jump in there. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, talking about opportunity, new opportunities in the Arctic, I guess, uh, and it's also a question of what communities uh, we are looking at. For Regarding indigenous communities that I represent, uh, what is important for us, which I tried to very briefly convey in my, my uh, commentary, was the opportunity to continue our livelihoods is at stake. And that would be our preferred uh, pathway is, of course, to we have inherited the thousands of year old culture, cultural livelihoods. And uh, we are standing many of these in uh, many communities. It's due to external stressors uh, with increased industry together with environmental and climate change. Uh, many of these reindeer husbandry entities are at the verge of of collapsing because uh, of lack of land and and other uh, uh, yeah lack of land and and ch challenges with with uh, uh, climate and environmental change. So so uh, we our primary goal is to be able to continue. Uh, that is our opportunity. But we are uh, if you look at the opportunities at the society at large, they tend to 
kind of try to place all the development of the land that we would need uh, for our future. So, so this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, what you call seed for conflict and is already conflict in, in some areas. Uh, so opportunities for all in the Arctic, uh, we have to be cautious about uh, how to manage this. David? Yes, building on the point by, by Ms. Gunnar, uh, first I used to work with the Sami Council many years ago, defending traditional knowledge in Guaypo to get that treaty on the protection of traditional knowledge and in indigenous communities uh, two decades ago. Still not done, but still trying to help. So it will come, let's hope. Now on socioeconomic impacts, again, uh, it's always a mixed result. In some areas, it will be negative. For example, very negative in terms of the ecosystems and impacts on mammals. You know, uh, and here are talking about all the, the the hunting that takes place in the Arctic Circle. You know, and also the raising of uh, different uh, 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 mammal species and reindeers, etc. So it's very important impact. There will be impacts on the coastline. There will be impacts on the permafrost that will make a, a coastal infrastructure more difficult. There will be opportunities in terms of new fish species coming, uh, whether invasive or not, for catch. There will be opportunities in tourism if communities want to have them or receive them, so that needs to be heavily regulated. Uh, we need to heavily regulate the cruise, the cruise tourism that goes into the Arctic and is paying nothing and is generating emissions. It has an impact, so there should be minimum, not only regulation by fees, to compensate impacts that they could generate if we're going to allow them. Again, many of the activities in the Arctic are not regulated. I would say, I think the principles here for a future in the Arctic, precaution, science, regulation, cooperation, coherence, uh, enforcement of existing regimes, even if not fully regulated. So there are many ways to go. And also there could be some opportunities for communities in the Arctic for, for certain other activities that are not taking place too much, like agriculture. The soil is not ready, but they could be non-soil based culture, depending if they want to do and that may complement food security. But again, depends. there is not a black and white picture uh, of the future. What we need is to be ready for the future and try to make the future whiter. For example, I am the point made that the ice cap is very important to reflect the sun rays and other radiations on the Earth is very important. Again, if we lose it, we again increase heat, uh, but at the same time uh, that depends a lot and many of the commitments we can get is on emission reduction worldwide. Again, the, the impacts in the Arctic are not generated by the Arctic. The impacts in the small island states are not generated by small island states. So the industrial energy consumption base has to significantly change if we want to stop this phenomenon. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, David. Perhaps Dr. Nair, you will have the closing reflection from our session. <clears throat> yes, I will, uh, if I um, collect together some of the threads that have been uh, at the heart of the discussion, then I would like to uh, first uh, emphasize that what we have seen in recent years uh, perhaps we should we can talk about 10 to 15 years or so is how uh, I mean first of all that the, uh, the nature and speed and scale of climate change in the Arctic is uh, faster and more dramatic than we uh, expected or scientists predicted several years ago. Uh, the consequences are uh, uh, are uh, felt across the planet and are much more dramatic and uh, unex and are unexpected in many ways, and uh, and uh, it would be a bit, um, uh, let's say, uh, un uh, not very wise to expect that we will not be that the scale and the nature and complexity of this problem across the globe will. Uh, cease to surprise us and come up with new uh, manifestations of how dramatic and complicated it can be. So we need to be uh, prepared for that. And uh, and finally, uh, if we take the focus back to the Arctic, 
then uh, it's very important to uh, to uh, as has been of course done you know in a more impressive way in the arctic than in most other parts of the planet is to incorporate different constituencies into the collaboration on science and policy making and efforts to understand the nature of the challenges and the problems uh, and a fundamentally important aspect of that which has been uh, in many ways done well in the arctic but can always be improved is to uh, in, is to include the uh, indigenous peoples and uh, give them uh, voice and uh, to appreciate the fact that uh, there are so many aspects of the challenges of climate change uh, that cannot be fully understood without uh, uh, local knowledge and uh, insights from people who are actually in living in the environment that is most seriously affected. Uh, and so uh, that would be my concluding remark, the importance of engaging uh, a very wide community of scientists and indigenous peoples and policymakers and uh, and to uh, and to create a comprehensive system for deliberations on uh, how to address the challenge. That's very well, very well put. Thank you very much, Dag Fenner, and thank you for all our speakers and all our participants. This is a quite a complex topic. We only barely touch the surface. Everything is interconnected. And it's important that we keep this conversation going towards COP28 and beyond. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us, and I invite you for joining us next week as well when we have a special session on climate justice, early warning, and loss and damage. We look forward to that engagement next week, and uh, see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a lovely day.